Hi there, everybody. This is Ben Nelm speaking here to give a presentation called Five Things a Treatment Planner Should Know About Physics and Vice Versa. This was partially given at the 2012 AAMD meeting in Atlanta, but for those of you who were there, I apologize. I didn't get to finish. Um, didn't have enough time, and there were buses waiting to go to a baseball game. So here I will repeat it, and I will get through it. Here we go. I th thought I'd start off with a little introduction because um, the history of treatment planning is really steeped in medical physics. Um, this is just a very general timeline of what I see as the history of treatment planning. And I'll go way back to 1896 and the, and the discovery of x-rays. And you can see for many decades there, the, uh, the use of radiation in, medic in medicine was limited to 2D radiographs and then some clinical use of x-rays on tumors as people realized that you could actually treat deep-seated uh, uh, targets inside the human body. In fact, the first patient was treated with protons in the 1950s, and then the same decade, clinical linear accelerators were developed. But it was really in the late 60s and the 70s that we had started to hit warp speed and modern computerized treatment planning came about. And this is for one reason, and that is computers. All the space race and, and the NASA and the Apollo program really amped up the development of computing power. And that same power was then able to be applied to uh, basically the simulation of dose deposition in the human body, but even before that into imaging, because it was really three-dimensional imaging, such as computed tomography, MR, and uh, nuclear medicine, that enabled three-dimensional treatment planning that has now come to the uh, all the things we know, such as uh, inverse planning, image guidance, and all those nice things. So really, the treatment planning evolution has followed not only the available therapy modalities, but also the advances is in computing. And all of these are deeply rooted in physics. So medical physics has really had an impact on treatment planning. In fact, treatment planning evolved from medical physics. The pioneers of computerized treatment planning were physicists. Probably before there was even a field called medical physics, it was physicists and early software developers. And of course, modern treatment planning system dose algorithms are purely physics-based. We have to somehow take this three-dimensional model of a patient and be able to simulate accurately what is the, what is the dose and where is it deposited in, in three dimensions. It can get highly complex, as you know, not only the delivery modalities, but also all the heterogeneities and the types of uh, volumes that a virtual patient can be made out of irregular surfaces, lung, bone, air cavities, these types of things. So this is all based in physics. So treatment planning and physics really go hand in hand. And then finally, the quality assurance, or QA, of the treatment planning system is the jurisdiction of the medical physicist for the most part. For example, if you look at AAPM Task Group 53, it's a really uh, uh, nice and ambitious and comprehensive look at what should be done to essentially commission a treatment planning system. So does medical physics e equal treatment planning? Uh, absolutely not. Of all the capabilities of a modern treatment planning system, I would only classify a subset of those as purely or wholly medical physics. Let's just take the, the global steps of doing treatment planning. First of all, there's data transfer. Does that equal physics? No, not really. This is information technology and networking. Some of you may have your physicists who do this, um, but it doesn't necessarily require uh, physics in its purest sense. When you create a virtual patient, is that physics? And here the answer is yes and no. Yes, because we do have to make a model more of electron density than anything else, although modern algorithms that are starting to do Monte Carlo and certainly algorithms for electrons and, and uh, to a certain extent protons depend on atomic composition, but mainly it's electron density. I'll cover that later in this talk. And that is physics-based. We have to be able to take imaging, like computed tomography images, which are usually generated, generated with kilovoltage x-rays, and we need to convert those into a model that our dose algorithm will understand and be able to calculate accurately in. Well, that's physics. But think about creating a virtual patient. Aside from making tissue voxels that are used in the algorithm, the, 
the main role is contouring. And contouring is certainly not uh, physics. You may have physicists who do it from time to time. It doesn't matter. It doesn't require physics. It requires anatomy and to a certain extent physiology. And if you're defining targets, it takes some knowledge or experience with where extensions of clinical disease can go. But that's not physics. Let's go to the next step, sculpting, sculpting dose or pushing dose around to meet the target volumes and avoid the critical structures. Is that physics? Again, yes and no. Yes, because you do need a dose calculation engine that will do it correctly. And that involves beam modeling. It also involves the development of those engines, which is physics in terms of the vendors. And then for the clinical medical physicist, this is optimizing the beam model. So yes, that's physics. But the lion's share of the work in sculpting dose is after the treatment planning system has been properly commissioned. And that is treatment planning. If, if the two biggest roles of treatment planning are really contouring, defining the important anatomy, and then designing the treatment plan. And being a medical physicist certainly does not guarantee you can create a good treatment plan. Um, it's really a specific art. I've been to centers, well, for example, in Canada, where uh, the last site I went to has a team of 14 medical physicists who do all the IMRT planning. And they're in the process of training their normal treatment planning staff. But it's much different in uh, depending on where you go. In the United States, treatment planning is primarily done by the role of the dosimetrist. Um, and sometimes you have dosimetrists who want the medical physicists as far away as possible from the treatment planning system because they may be able to think they can do a treatment plan, but they're not. It's not their specific art. So yes and no is sculpting dose physics. It involves physics, but you don't have to be a physicist then to do treatment planning. And finally then, plan review. Is that physics? Again, yes and no. Here, primarily no. But yes, because the plan needs to be deliverable and accurate. So accurate would be, is the, is the algorithm properly commissioned, the beam model optimized? Is it deliverable? Can your machine deliver this accurately? Have you avoided potential uh, machine uh, sources of error so it can pass the quality assurance at a high level? But other than that, plan review is really, uh, meet, does it meet clinical requirements, a DVH-based goals? Those types of plan criteria are not physics either. So treatment planning is not synonymous with medical physics, as we all know. We have a division of labor in in the process of treatment planning, but that does not mean we want a division of knowledge. When I was um, asking for a, a lot of the topics that treatment planners wanted to know about physics, I got a lot of feedback that was uh, a little kind of surprising and, and, and kind of not, but it seems that in a lot of clinics, there's a little bit of friction or perhaps a wall that's built up between the medical physics staff and treatment planning. Certainly not everywhere, but in some of the places, the types of questions I was getting, there is a little, uh, maybe a little professional animosity, and I really see this as a bad thing. You don't want a fiefdom. A fiefdom is where people try to keep control of their own piece of the land and keep others out. That's really counterproductive. In fact, the quality philosophy um, that, that really works in manufacturing, and I consider treatment planning a complex and, and highly skilled form of manufacturing, requires that a profound knowledge is had by all of the system, the entire system. This requires sharing of knowledge, not holding your own little corner of the universe. I thought I'd give a little uh, cute analogy. Some of you treatment planners can pick what you think is most appropriate. Medical physicist is to treatment planner as CEO is to secretary. Some of you may feel that way as a funny science geek is to the cool kid, as a parent is to a child, as a child is to a parent, as a genius is to a, oh, I'm just happy to bask in your glow, almighty physicist, or is it more like an aloof know-it-all is to a tolerant saint, or is it as a teacher is to a student, or as a student is to a teacher, or is it as a coach and equipment manager is to an athlete? Clearly, I'm being a little cheeky here because a lot of these, I think, represent the stereotypical relationships a physicist has with the dosimetry staff. 
the only ones that are really healthy are teacher, student, student, teacher, and kind of coach and equipment manager to athlete. I view the treatment planning system as the main tool of the athlete, which is the treatment planner. Treatment planner might be a physicist, but usually isn't. And that equipment needs to be really in tip-top shape for the athlete to perform at their highest level. But the physicist needs to teach certain aspects of physics to the treatment planner. Likewise, the treatment planner needs to teach the physicist uh, what they need in their system. And so I really see this as a, 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 a complementary relationship. So today's five things that I'm going to go through that I think uh, are more or less physics related or generally seen as a physics jurisdiction um, that are important for a treatment planning to pl planner to know. I'm going to go through the following. The big one is going to be dose deposition. I'm going to take this, stay at a high level, but I'm going to cover the important things. Dose grid resolution. Some of you will be surprised what you learn here. Even more surprising what you don't know you don't know, and that is DVH resolution. I'm going to talk about plan complexity, what I see as an often misunderstood concept. And usually if it's misunderstood, it's because of the physicist. And then finally, something we all know we understand or think we understand, and that's margins. And I've got some simulations that are actually physics-based that will help reiterate the importance of margins. Now, as I go through, the, through these five things, I want to try to give a what, in, a, in other words, a background. Then I want to give a so what, meaning what are the implications? Why is this important to the treatment planner? And then a what now? And I picked five things where there really could be some kind of practical application that you can take back to your physicist or, 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 or to seek more knowledge on. That will affect your day-to-day -day life as a professional treatment planner. A disclaimer, by no means are these the only five things. There are so many topics that people want to discuss. Um, and so I picked five general ones that are a good bedrock or foundation. But there are so many more that are ripe for uh, teaching and discussion. So hopefully this talk, though not comprehensive, hopefully it will catalyze treatment planners to ask more questions about physics, to realize that physics is, is important to your job and not separate from your job. I hope that it inspires physicists to share or maybe even to learn for the first time applicable, applicable knowledge relevant to treatment planning. And then finally, maybe it'll facilitate a continuing education of treatment planners on, on similar topics. For example, maybe the AAMD can take the lead on a series of webinars that are, that are done by physicists or uh, uh, people invited to give webinars on certain physics-based topics that are helpful to the treatment planner. And this could be a continuing series that's really um, focused in on some of the things that you can understand about treatment planning that are physics-based. Well, anyway, that's the end of the introduction, so let's get going. Okay, the first topic today is a bit of a doozy. There's a lot to cover. This will be the longest one. And I'm just going to call it, what is dose and how does it get there? A lot of aspects here that are a critical foundation of knowledge for the treatment planner because, uh, as you'll see, a lot of the intuition and profound knowledge you can have in what you're trying to do, as, as in sculpting the dose, is rooted in knowing what happens to get dose in the body in the first place. Well, just a quick review of dose. You all know this. Dose is really a ratio, a ratio of absorbed energy per unit mass. So the unit of gray is a joule per kilogram. Um, quick thought question. If you have a thousand cubic centimeters of lung and a thousand cubic centimeters of water and both receive 10 gray, how much energy is absorbed in each? Now a lot of you may think, well, they both get 10 gray, so they have an equal amount of energy. But no, the lung is absorbing about a third um, the energy of the water because it is less dense. There's less mass there. So just uh, something to realize there that really dose is a ratio. Dose from photons, and I'll concentrate on photons today. Of course, electron algorithms and more and more proton algorithms are, are important. But I'm going to concentrate on photons. Uh, photoelectric effect is important. This, is, this happens in the low energy range. 
and, uh, and in high Z matter. Another important player is pair production. This happens for much higher energies and typically for high Z materials. But Compton scattering is far and away, as far as therapeutic dose deposition, is the dominant physical interaction. This drives radiation therapy dose deposition with photons. Let's talk about what happens when a photon starts hitting something, be it metal in a LINAC, like a collimator or an MLC leaf, or a human or a couch or whatever. Photons interact in matter. And what the first aspect we need to have a good handle on is attenuation. So when a photon interacts in whatever way, be it photo, photoelectric effect, pair production, or more likely the Compton effect, Whenever it interacts, it's said to be attenuating. So that photon becomes something else, and that becomes a, uh, an event of attenuation. So as photons go through the body, some, there's a certain probability that they'll interact. And uh, when they interact, they cause scatter. Now, don't confuse photon attenuation with what happens with a particle, such as an electron or a proton. Really, electrons and protons lose energy but keep going. Photon attenuation causes an event where it becomes other things. So let's talk about that, and that's defined by scatter. Photon scatter is, is, is a general concept. It can be a whole lot of different things. Once a photon interacts in whatever way, its energy becomes multiple things, such as perhaps a lower energy photon, scattered photons. Um, it can become the form of electron kinetic energy. And in the case of pair production, it can become a positron-electron pair. Now, these things, these potential, uh, call them particles or scattered photons that are created from the initial photon, then go on and do other things. You can almost treat them now as a new photon or a new electron. And there's this cascade of events, and it looks like scatter. So things happen, and when you think about Monte Carlo simulation, what's going on is that you're running a whole bunch of what are called histories, and you're tracing photon interaction, and then that photon becomes, let's say, a scattered photon and a, an electron. Now you trace each of those two uh, things, and, and there's this cascade of events. And for high-energy photons, the cascade of events can really reach far and wide. But with a large number of simulations, it, there's a pattern. So scatter exudes from everywhere not just the human body. So when you hear your physicist talking about scatter, it can mean a lot of things. It can be the scatter of photons from the flattening filter, from the primary collimator, from the MLC. There can be, there's a scatter effect in a bolus, in, a, in, a, in an aperture. Of course, there's scatter in the patient, in the couch. All of this is governed by the same rules of physics. And really, Scatter presents the principal challenge of TPS beam modeling. So when your physicist is trying hard to, to model their beams, a lot of what they're doing is trying to model the effects of scatter on dose deposition and also directly related to that is on uh, uh, monitor unit calculation because the more scatter there is or the less scatter there is clearly has an effect on uh, the monitor unit calculation. Now what happens with all this stuff going on in tissue? Eventually, there's ionizing energy that's transferred to the matter. And this can cause damage to tissue via ionization, or perhaps it can create a free radical, which is an unstable particle, usually uh, oxygen, that, can, that free radical wants to go and screw something up. It wants to go cause some damage. Well, the important target that we talk about in radiation therapy is DNA. Um, because if you damage the DNA, sometimes it may not repair perfectly. And when it doesn't, it'll either cause the cell to die or in some cases maybe mutate. But DNA is the sensitive target. This was discovered a long time ago. And of course, cancer cells, what we try to exploit is that in general, cancer cells don't repair quite as well as normal tissues. This is why we fractionate. Now, why don't they repair as well if I had the if I had to do it at a, say it at a high level, I'd say that cancer cells are really good at dividing and multiplying, but they are kind of stupid when it comes to cell repair. Whereas if you get a healthy nerve cell, for example, especially a highly differentiated cell, 
they are they are very important and they don't divide at all once they're differentiated they don't replenish so they need to be very good at repair um, some cells that divide a lot skin gut things like that um, we don't care so much if they die as long as we can replenish them but cancer cells are screwed up cells that are really good at dividing not so good at repair so what we do is with every fraction we try to knock down the number of cancer cells a little bit more than we knock down the normal tissues and the normal tissues we hope will heal or either or if they're differentiated we hope they heal um, or if they're not differentiated we hope they replenish so we exploit this with fractionation fractionation and that's why we uh, unless we can really be precise with the radiation we hit it in a bunch of fractions um, well and you know the rest now another thought question just to make sure we're on the same page here if a typical 6 MV beam, in a typical 6 MV beam, there's an incident spectrum of photon energies. They're not all 6 MV, and they're not all a single energy for a, for a linear accelerator, at least. If it's cobalt, it's a little different, where we have two pure energies. But let's talk about a LINAC. We have uh, electrons that go and splatter off the target. The breaking radiation of the brimstone radiation creates the photons that we use to treat the patient with. So now I have this question, how much energy is deposited in the tissue by photons in the range 0 to 2, photons in the range 2 to 4, and photons in the range 4 to 6? So try to think about that, pick one that you think is an answer. I'll give you a little hint here with this graph. Here's what a typical energy spectra for a 6 MV beam looks like. And the energy on the x-axis is, is MeV. And this is the spectrum or the kind of a population distribution with the flattening filter in pink and then uh, we're getting more and more frequent flattening filter free beams these days with the variant true beam those tend to have a, a little spike in the low energy because the flattening filter is not hardening the beam anyway you see here that most of the photons are in zero to two and then there's two to four and four to six so back to the question how much energy is deposited looking at that picture you might say well, clearly zero to two but really this was a trick question the answer is none of the above Photons do not deposit the energy in the tissue that we care about. Photons just interact. And ultimately, the energy that gets deposited in the tissue is driven by the charged particles that we set in motion. It's those charged particles that do the work. So a photon interaction or the attenuation event is not what drives dose directly. So let's talk about what does. But first, I wanted to go over some of those interactions again. We all use CT images like crazy. Uh, a, a 2D kilovoltage X-ray, we see those all the time ever since we were kids and we were breaking our bones. But really, in, in, your, in your professional job, you see the CT images. Well, the CT pixel values, this again, these are kilovoltage. High quality diagnostic imaging will use kilovoltage and not megavoltage. This is driven, uh, th this amplifies the photoelectric effect. High Z materials, such as bone, absorb a lot more efficiently if uh, you know it has to do with the, uh, the, 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 the electron energy levels etc so if that elect for the photons in just the right energy they're really absorbed readily and this is in the low energy range with kilovoltage this is why bones are so easy to see in x-rays and why they're nice and bright and white on a CT image problem is CT pixels do not scale linearly to either a physical or an electron density now, why does that matter? Well, because dose algorithms, remember, I, they're driven by the Compton scattering. What we need then is we need to generate an electron density matrix out of these CT scans. Now, this is part of treatment planning. Whether you know it or not, this is happening in one way or another for all of your modern treatment plans. And how we do this usually, it depends on the planning system, but a, one simple way to do it, an effective way, is to map a CT number to a relative electron density. Everywhere from zero, roughly zero uh, electron density or uh, uh, air, you know, really low dense, to just above water when we start to get into things that look like ligament and cartilage, it's linear. The CT number really does map pretty well with the density. But then it takes a turn down, the slope decreases, and that's because as we get denser and denser above the water equivalent density, 
beyond muscle and get into the bone and the dense bone, there's, there is uh, more high Z material, which drives the photoelectric effect for these diagnostic Im uh, images. And that amps up the CT pixel, but it's not changing the density that the dose deposition cares about. So we have to basically on our relative electron density, uh, if we're mapping that from a CT number, the slope decreases. Electron density is important, again, because of Compton scattering, which is the dominant interaction for megavoltage therapy photons. Quick picture here. If I were to take this CT slice, which you can see has bone, air, muscle, and fat, et cetera, the whole range, if I were to map this into what your, it, what your uh, uh, TPS sees as the density matrix that it will simulate dose in, if you don't do a heterogeneity correction, this is what the algorithm sees just like a big bag of water in the shape of a patient. Of course, you, people don't do that much anymore. Sometimes, uh, or in the transition to CT-based, you can assign a density. This is used a lot, by the way, when you have QA phantoms, where you assign a uniform density to the whole phantom rather than rely on a CT. And if I assigned a density to lung and everywhere else I set it equal to water, it may look like this. This, again, is what the algorithm would see. Finally, though, in a modern, uh, uh, when you're doing a CT-based heterogeneity, it may look like this picture in the lower right. Here, it's hard to see the difference, but if I were to sample the pixel values, those areas in the bone, would not they're not quite as bright or high uh, in the bone as they are in the, in the CT or in the kilovoltage image. And that's because we have traced it to the electron density. That's what the Compton effect cares about. So we've, in a sense, dampened those high pixel values from the CT image. And that's very important to do. Otherwise, you end up over attenuating a beam. We're talking a lot about Compton scattering. Let me just give you a quick picture. You have an incident photon. There's this sea of electrons that are, that are made up. Usually, it, well, it's the electrons in the atoms, of course. Not so much the inner shell, but they're they're more or less seen as free electrons, but all these electrons are interacting in atoms and molecules. When that photon can interact with an electron, you create a recoil electron and a lower energy photon, and it becomes scattered. This picture kind of shows you what happens at the Compton effect. For therapeutic energy photons, then it attenuates. If I have a beam coming down on a flat water phantom here, what the total energy that's released per unit mass is called the terma. In fact, that's what the acronym is, total energy released per unit mass. This is driven by attenuation. But that doesn't equal dose. Each time there's an interaction, based again on the Compton effect and all the potential cascade of events, we create what's called a dose kernel. Every interaction, if you ran a simulation a kajillion times over, would produce a picture kind of like this. This is a kernel for a 6 MV beam. What you have to do is you convolve the, all the interactions or the terma with the dose kernel and you create what looks like your dose. This is of course just a two-dimensional slice, but this is what you see in dose. And a couple things you want to remark is that even though attenuation starts, it's, it's a, the total energy release per unit mass is the highest at the entry and then attenuates. Once you get to dose, you see there's a buildup. At the entry, you see it's blue, but then it gets higher and higher. It reaches what we know is called D max. Why does that happen? Because all these kernels are pushing electrons and scattering photons, and they're kind of piling up on each other and reaching a maximum at what's called the D max depth. Scatter also explains why you see the blurriness at the edges. Look at the crisp, clean edges on the terma. Well, we lose those when the photons interact. This blur and this buildup become the key components that you are managing and in some cases exploiting when you're doing treatment planning. High energy photon scatter is actually asymmetric when we get into heterogeneous tissue. If we have uniform water kernel, if I were to uh, simulate that with a less dense material on the left and water on the right, you see the dose scatter almost, it, 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 it almost diffuses or blows up. The, the scatter reaches farther because the material is less dense. So if you were to do this now over a complex patient shape, you will see all of these things, a modern algorithm will try to trace them and you will see the effects of heterogene heterogeneous tissue. So the advantage of having these variant dose kernels 
is it allows you to really represent physical interactions of photons and the electrons they put into motion. In other words, dose. Dose deposition in and near tissue heterogeneities is therefore calculated more accurately. And modern algorithms started exploiting this with algorithms such as superposition, collapsed cone convolution, to a certain extreme Monte, uh, Monte Carlo simulates this very well, although Monte Carlo has its own uh, set of issues as far as being a little noisy. At any rate, any good algorithm will take into account the heterogeneous nature of the human. So what? Why am I talking about all this? Well, some of the key concepts you know. The terma and the scatter w explains the buildup effect. That's skin spare. So as a result, it also explains the bolus effect, which is essentially just taking that D-max and putting it up closer to the skin so that we can get more dose near the very edge of the patient where it would normally be in the buildup region. That's all just the physics of more or less Compton scatter and interaction. This also explains physical limits on dose conformality. There is a certain extent of conformality that you can achieve with photons and you can't get any better. And I think as treatment planners, you do need to realize there is... If, if you have physicians who try to push the limit, there's a certain limit where because of the nature of scatter and the practicality of all the angles you can come in, there's a point where you can't get any better with photons. It's important to understand that is more or less driven by the scatter um, dose in and near lung and in targets embedded in the lung. A lot of you may have been doing treatment planning when you transitioned from doing prescriptions based on homogeneous dose calcs to heterogeneous dose calcs in order to do that involved an understanding of what is happening and a transition where you would calculate the same plan twice so the physician could understand what they always thought was a certain dose has really always been this other dose. Dose at tangential portions of the patient's surface. Think about when a beam, part of it goes off in the air and part of it hits the patient. There is a scatter that's lost outside the patient and scatter that's not coming in from outside the patient and that causes an effect near the patient surface that we know about. Also, just driven by those pretty easy physics interactions. So you need to be able to see that blur. You need to be able to understand what's contributing dose at any point. It's its surroundings, it's terma, it's dose kernels. This also punctuates the importance of a good dose algorithm and the importance of a good beam model. I can't overemphasize this. A good beam model needs to be able to model terma accurately, needs to be able to model the dose kernel accurately in order to model dose accurately. And depending on your planning system, there's different hoops you need to jump through to get it working. Here's an example, <clears throat> one example I'm going to show you of a problem that was in a beam model. And these are a little more common than people think because some of the QA tolerances are really loose. And so people don't have to drive their TPS to the highest extent. Well, Here's a case where there was, in reality, an underdose of the PTV by about 4%. The planned dose was here in the upper left. The actual dose looked very similar, but when we looked at the difference, there were regions of lower dose. You didn't know this during the treatment plan, but it was discovered. Well, what was causing this? This was actually something the physicist is in charge of with the planning system, something called the tongue and groove effect. As you know, these MLC leaves... Uh, as they move next to each other, there's a tongue and a groove. And if you're hitting the tongue on the outside of a leaf, you're doing a little bit of attenuation on that exposed side, which causes a less dose than you think if you model a very simple MLC leaf. If you've got this turned on in your planning system and modeled well, you won't have uh, uh, this problem. But if you don't, or if you model it improperly, your dose at those tongue regions will be lower than what you think it is. This was a case where it was almost perfect QA passing rates, but they all these tongue and groove effect, which you see as these blue stripes, that was really happening, and it was sucking dose out, so it wasn't really being deposited in the patient when uh, the treatment planner thought it was. This was a physics problem, though, not a treatment planning problem, but it was having an impact and causing a shift in the dose that was actually being delivered. So you can see how one very simple thing in the planning system affects uh, treatment planning. Here's another example. Almost the same thing, an underdosage of the target regions. Planned, actual, and you see blue again. This was caused by improper modeling of an MLC leaf end. MLC leaf ends have different shapes, and some are rounded, and so you, they can't be treated as purely flat and divergent. 
in this case, the TPS was set up wrong so that it was thinking the dose was higher than it really was. Um, once that was fixed, this problem went away. And again, this was escaping conventional physics QA because a 3% 3, 3 millimeter mentality lets a lot of these errors go undetected. So just realize as a treatment planner, there are things you may not know about that will affect that beautiful plan that you create will make it truly unachievable in life, in real life. And that could be due to some very simple beam modeling problems like this. Here's another example. This is an interesting example. Look at planned, and then actual is much crisper and cleaner dose. And the difference shows there's a lot of differences on the gradients. And when we look at the DVH, in reality, this thin line, which is the actual DVH, for the targets and even for the critical structures, was better than your treatment plan. Reality was better than the treatment plan. Why, how on earth could this happen? Well, this was a really bad energy spectrum and source model in the TPS. This was causing what the TPS thought the dose deposition was to be far too blurry. Again, undetected by conventional dose QA because it was in high gradient regions only and there are certain allowances in those regions. The problem here is that the treatment planner was stuck with this blurry model. That makes not only the plan inaccurate, but it makes the planning more difficult. How many extra minutes or hours were spent trying to achieve these DVH goals when you're really just fighting with a bad beam model? If you had had a correct beam model in this case, it would have been much easier to achieve these more advantageous target DVHs. So what now? Practical applications. Let's bring this first topic to a close. I've been talking forever on it. Well. If you understand about attenuation, then you understand about the selection of energy. Everyone knows if you need to go deeper, you choose a higher energy. That's all based on attenuation. Appreciation of the limit of what's possible. That has to do with scatter. You need to be able to say, come on, doc. I know I'm great at treatment planning, but I cannot defy the laws of physics. I think someday there will be some really cool tools where before you even start the treatment plan, you'll already know what is achievable in a best case scenario and you won't be asked to do better than that. Those tools don't exist today, but they would probably help a lot of you. Uh, because I think sometimes you're asked to do things that may be near the realm of possibility. Understand how to best build the virtual patient. You understand how to map these heterogeneous CT volumes to either electron density or some kind of mass density that the treatment planning system can make use of. Important is the inclusion of the treatment table, especially as we get into VMAT and rotational therapy. A lot of the beams kind of come up through the bottom of the table. So it's important to model that treatment table in order to get accurate dose calculation in the patient. Bolus effect. Not only of a bolus, but think about immobilization devices. Those have a bolus effect as well. And uh, now that you un can really see in your head what's happening when photons first interact and then those interactions cause this cascade of events, you can see how immobilization devices can perturb the dose, sometimes causing a bolus effect. More what now? Well, with this knowledge, you can help the transition of what I call old dogs to new tricks. If you're going to a new modality, or if you remember the in the history going from a hom homogeneous model to a heterogeneity-based corrections for lung plans, knowing and understanding these concepts is going to help you train uh, maybe the physician on what they're actually seeing. And it's just a basic understanding of these laws of physics that drive dose deposition. Finally, you're, you're really a stakeholder in the beam model. So hopefully your relationship with your physicist is good because their beam modeling has a direct effect, whether you know it or not, on your work. Um, I think there are a lot of pretty poor beam models out there. I do a lot of work with QA, and I see when I, when I really look at stringent criteria, all the treatment planning systems are able to do very well now these days, well, at least the major ones. But that doesn't mean if you have that planning system that it's going to be good. There's this beam modeling. There's the quality of the input dosimetry data that drives the beam modeling. There's the modeling parameters themselves, how they've been commissioned. And there's a whole gambit, and poor models are not, uh, they're not rare. Um, poor models generally make treatment planning harder, and of course they are a disservice to the patients. 
So be cognizant and encourage your, your physicists, even if they think their B model is perfect, inspire them to make it as perfect as possible. And be curious as to whether your TPSB models are meeting high performance benchmarks and not just the status quo of 3% 3 millimeter, which turn out to be very, very lax. All right, that's the end of that section. We just covered dose deposition, which is a big topic. Well, now I'm going to bring it and make a very specific and much easier topic. Dose grid resolution, or as I call it, your screen is lying to you. Let's talk about resolution a little bit. Here I've just created a picture. Uh, high pixel values I'm rendering as red, low pixel values as blue, and this would be a very high resolution image. I took the same data and I resampled it at different resolutions, sparse or sampling, and then I interpolated in between. Visually, you can't really tell the difference. Maybe the one on the right starts to look a little blurrier, but just looking at the screen, you can't tell the difference. But the actual values, the, the mathematical values, turn out to be quite a bit different. If I take that same rationale and I take some that's just a grid of black and white, now apply the same sparser sampling and then reinterpolation as I go to the right, you can see the stripes on the right are much blurrier and, don't, and they start to not look as much like this high resolution image that I started with. Let me do a better picture. And here I'm emulating a, a dose profile. So this would be draw a line through a three-dimensional dose. And let's say this yellow line represents the accurate high-resolution dose, the real dose. You see it's very complex as a dose from any IMRT beam can be. Well, what if I sample it only at a few places? Here I'm simulating four millimeter. Because unfortunately, four millimeter tends to be at least for one of the planning systems, a very common dose grid resolution. As you'll see as I move on, it's wholly inadequate. If you're using four millimeters, stop. It is not good enough for conformal treatment planning. But here, if I take this nice complex yellow dose line and I resample it at every four millimeters, that's everywhere I have a dose point. If I then connect the dots, look at the red line compared with the original yellow line. We miss the peaks, we miss the valleys, we miss some of this substructure, and that all matters. That is all, we're, we're throwing information away by subsampling at such a coarse resolution, that's four millimeters. Think about it, for most of your MLCs, the leaf widths as projected to isocenter are gonna be either five millimeters or in some cases, four millimeters. For some older MLCs, they're 10 millimeters. But let's take a Varian 120 leaf, for example. The center leaves are five millimeters projected to central axis. If we're only sampling dose every four millimeters, that is just not nearly enough to capture the gradients. So just think about it that way. Here's an identical plan calculated at both four millimeter on the left and two millimeter in the middle. And then the, do the actual difference. You can see the dose differences are, turn out to be quite large just because of the fact that when you calculate at a low resolution, in order to get things like DVH or dose profiles, you have to interpolate between those dose grid points. And from this previous picture I showed, you threw away a lot of the peaks, a lot of the valleys. When you throw those away and then compare it to reality or closer to reality, which is the two millimeter grid, you can see there's quite a bit of difference. This is the exact same plan, just calculated at, at low and high resolution. It affects DVH. Here are those, here is that plan Ex again, exactly the same plan, same monitor units, same segments, everything was identical, just calculated at two different resolutions, and we see big changes in the DVHs. They may not look that big on the screen, but there's definitely a shift in the targets. But look at the brainstem. The high resolution, or the more accurate um, max dose, was greater than the low resolution max dose by 3.5%. So doing at low res, we have a 3.5% error just because we did a low resolution. Look at the cord. The cord dose, max dose, is 6.3% 3, 6 different. Again, with the high res being higher. Always the higher resolution you get, or the smaller the grid spacing, you're going to better map the maxes, the, the mins, and everything's going to be more accurate. Here's an example that doesn't just affect uh, 
DVHs. It affects isodose lines. This is this is a different planning system with a dose calculated here, high resolution on the left, low resolution or four millimeter on the right. Just look at the different in the in the uh, magenta isodose lines, even in the red isodose lines. This is a much smoother isodose. We even start to pick up these little peaks and valleys uh, shown by these islands. We hardly even, on, on one side, we don't even capture that with low resolution. So if you have physicians that are using isodose lines to make any type of decision, and you're using four millimeter grid resolution, you're giving them garbage. You're giving them inaccurate isodose line. If you were to move to two millimeter, you start to get more confident in what in the plan you're generating. Here's that same plan and how the DVH curves are different. Again, here the high res are actually getting better coverage. It's the same coverage in real life, but it's better coverage when you trace it to a higher resolution. Here's a dose profile. High res shows that you get these little bumps. This is an actual dose profile, high res and low res. And, and you can see this, these dots here are the re real shape. And then the black line is the course. And you see the black line will cut off the peaks and cut off the valleys. And the peaks and the valleys are really what matter in IMRT and VMAP. So treatment planning for high gradient complex plans, which is IMRT and VMAP, really requires that you use high resolution dose grid. So let's try to understand what's going on here. On the screen, it looks like high resolution all the time because your treatment planning system makes it look beautiful. But your beautiful image may be based on garbage or at least near garbage. But it looks nice because we've interpolated this beautiful color wash or interpolated the isodose lines. And when you see it on the screen, you think that's real. But the only points that you can count on, let's say you have a perfect beam model, the only points you can really count on are the actual dose grid points. So if you have four millimeter, you only have a real data point every four millimeters. If you go to two millimeters, now you have a real data point every two millimeters, and you have eight times the number of trustworthy data points in a volume because two and four, it's off by a factor of two, but then you cube that when you go to a volume. So even though you may see this beautiful dose color wash on the screen and think that's real because it's, it's, it, it looks high resolution, it may have been based on data that was really clunky like this. Here's another example, you may see this, but it really may be based on this. This is actually two and a half millimeter resolution. The higher uh, the resolution is, the lower the grid spacing, the more trustworthy everything is. So dose grid. I think a coarse grid is really anything greater than three, and in some cases, three millimeters is too coarse. For small targets, for SBRT, for things like that, that's too low. Low resolution means your dose calc is less accurate. Your treatment plan is less accurate. If that's true, your isodose displays are less accurate. Your dose at the gradients is less accurate. DVH curves and statistics are less accurate. Your monitor unit calculations, believe it or not, are affected by the dose grid resolution. They will have a problem. Less accurate means your hard work was partly in vain. It's not, uh, I mean, if you're in charge of the resolution, then good, you can go and have an impact. If your physicist says, don't touch the resolution, I always want it to be four, then you need to have a discussion, and we need to we need to bring that down. Um, hopefully, your physicist is telling you the opposite. They're telling you always do a resolution that's fine. Coarse grid hurts where it matters the most in modern treatment planning. Graphics manipulations make a poor resolution look smooth, so that's why the screen can be lying to you. Smooth pictures look pretty. Doctors like pretty pictures. Therefore, doctors may like pictures that are inaccurate. We need to realize, don't always trust the pretty pictures. In fact, I suggest if you can turn off the dose interpolation visually on your screen, then it's a nice uh, sanity check. If it's ugly, it probably means your resolution was ugly. If it's really coarse and blocky so much that it's distracting, then it's distracting for a reason. You need to make it higher resolution. So this is a sanity check on your dose grid. Let's take a step back. What's the history of low resolution dose? Well, of course, this has to do with calculation time. Back in the early days of 3D treatment planning and modern algorithms, calculation time could take a long time. Computers weren't near as fast, and algorithms were a little more clunky. So in general, if you went two times the density, 
back of the envelope approximation, this might cause eight times the number of calculation points, eight times the calc time. And if the calculation time was already 10 minutes, you just went to 80 minutes, it's unsatisfactory. Even though poor accuracy is never justified by fast calc times. Well, this isn't really a problem anymore. Um, it's not as much a problem. Computers keep getting faster and faster and cheaper and cheaper. We see vendors now moving their calculations from the CPU over to the GPU or the graphics processor, which is much faster. So things are getting faster, meaning you can throw away those legacy decisions about low resolution. A problem that exists a lot out there, unfortunately, is that a physicist may do their, they may ask you or do the QA calcs. I don't know if the treatment planner does the QA calcs at your site or if the physicist does them, but if you do those at a higher resolution, the physicist may ask you to do that because they get better results. Why? Because the calculation is more accurate. They want the QA calculation to be accurate so it matches the measurement. The problem is if you're using a higher resolution for the QA calcs than you are on the patient, then you've completely, you're off your wagon. It's crazy. You're off your rocker, I should say. Uh, it's nuts because that means you realize to get it accurate, you need to do high resolution. You do that for your QA calcs. If you don't do it for your patient calcs, that means you're accepting garbage on your patient calcs, and that's really what matters. This is a very poor practice. We're supposed to optimize accurate dose to the patient, not just the phantom. So, um, so what now? I personally think two to maybe two and a half millimeter grid, you start to see a lot of the interpolation course effect, the effects of course grid get mitigated. And in fact, going below two millimeters, you, you don't get a lot of bang for the buck, unless it's a really, really tiny beam, maybe like a cyber knife beam. But certainly four millimeters is too big. Three millimeters is sometimes too big. I suggest you reset your defaults to something accurate. Next, make sure your QA calculations that you do for the physicist are done at the same resolution as the patient plan. This will then self-rectify the situation. If you're doing four millimeters on your patients and the physicist gets four millimeter QA calcs, they're gonna see results they don't like very much. It's because they're seeing this effect of blurring and approximation. They're missing the peaks, they're missing the valleys, their QA comes out worse. So in order to, do, to make that better, you need higher resolution. Well, if you change it on the QA calc to get it to match your measurement, change it on the patient as well so that you can trust your DVHs and your isodose line. If you want, see if you can turn off the visual interpolation of planar dose display because that ugly could be telling you something. Like I said, this is a visual sanity check. And finally, to vendors, please choose defaults that aren't stupid. Some planning systems have a default grid resolution of four millimeters. And I will go on the record for saying that's stupid. Now, I kind of understand a vendor may argue, hey, we we'll let the user set it to whatever they want. It's up to the user. It's not our job. There's a certain truth to that. But the problem is you go and you talk to a lot of people and you say, why are you doing four millimeter grid resolution? And they say, well, it's because of what the planning system has a default, so it must be the best choice. In other words, there's a little bit of a disconnect. The vendors are passing the buck to the, to the users, but the users are assuming the planning system defaults are adequate and often they are not. So, something to consider, and that is dose grid resolution. Since we're on the topic of resolution, let me talk about a resolution settings that you may not even know exist in your planning system. DVH resolution, yes, yet another resolution. Let's revisit what a DVH is, dose volume histogram at its very nature it's a histogram it's a statistical think of it like a frequency distribution or a population distribution on the x-axis we have dose on the y-axis we have percent volume or absolute volume so we go through every little tiny little section of dose and we ask what is that dose and we throw it in its corresponding bin a bin being a holder for that type of dose so you may have two dose points that are very similar in dose that may go in the same bin so there's something called the bin width, and that really matters. That is one critical aspect of DVH resolution. And most planning systems allow you to set your bin width, and you may not have known that. 
And in certain planning systems, this bin width default, default value is way too fat, way too wide. And so what you're doing is doses may start to be a lot different, but you throw them in the same bin, and that affects the shape of your DVH curve. So the bin width is really the delta dose, or the dose increment, where dose values are, are, are deemed as equal and they get thrown in. You can see here what happens is the shape of the DVH is always a smooth line on your screen. This is a cumulative DVH. What I show here on this previous picture, that's a differential DVH. It's like a population distribution. If we do a cumulative DVH, which is what uh, you as clinicians are used to looking at, it's the same data, just shown diff in a different way um, so that it drops from 100% to zero. You can see the exact same dose distribution for a wide bin width versus a smaller bin width, and the shape of the yellow curve starts to change. As with any resolution, the higher resolution you go, usually the more reliable your stati statistics are. Again, where is it the biggest effect? At gradients region. So before we talked about dose grid resolution and dose gradients, now we talk about DVH resolution and DVH gradients. For example, the falling edge of a target DVH. There can be another problem besides bin width. This isn't true for all planning systems, but at least for a few of them. If a separate DVH sampling grid is used, what that means is that you've already got this three-dimensional dose grid. Some planning systems put this other grid and they go and they, point, they count out interpolated dose values at this other resolution. You may completely step over those dose points, and remember those dose points are the only ones we knew accurately. This can only hurt. We're just throwing data. We're making more and more and more approximations. This uses interpolated, interpolated data and throws out good data. Got an example here. I was contacted by a user uh, once about difference. Same data rendered DVHs in two different systems. Uh, in this instance, there was a planning system, and then they regenerated the DVHs using a, a product of mine called 3DVH, and they said, hey, I get a different values, especially, for example, look at this max dose. Here there's a, an organ called uh, mama D, which means right breast. Their treatment planning system told them the max dose was 24.84 gray. That's the TPS value. When they took the exact same dose grid in DICOM and they imported it into 3DVH, or uh, I'm sorry, this was actually using a different software that I've worked on with ROR called ROX. It's what they drive the plan challenges with. Sorry, I'm getting my products mixed up. Well, we looked at it, and if I look at it in ROX, it's 29.01. That's a huge difference in max dose. So the user was like, hey, 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 you gave me the max dose wrong. My TPS says 24.84. You told me it was 29.01. Something's wrong with your system. Well, when we dig deeper, let's check. I actually found a dose grid point where the dose grid was exactly 29.01, and it was at the center of this voxel right here where this white arrow is. You can see it is obviously inside the red or the blue contour, 29.01. What happened? The TPS, when we looked into it, they had two problems. First, they were using a 4-millimeter dose grid sampling. Second, the DVH resampling was 2 millimeters, and it was on a totally different grid. So it was just popping over, and what happened is it stepped right over this max dose point. And a little, to the, a little above and a little left, it was lower, and that's what they used as the max dose. Completely missed this. Again, resolution cuts out peaks, cuts out valleys. So this was a problem in the TPS, uh, was only caught when we re-rendered this DVH. In other, word, the us in other words, the user had no idea that they had such low-quality DVHs. They didn't even know there were settings that they could optimize in this system. They were able to go in and generate high-resolution DVHs, and then the max dose uh, became 29. So you may not have even known there were DVH uh, resolution settings in your TPS. There are. Most systems have a bin width. And again, some of the default values are way too wide. So uh, go in, explore a little bit in your planning system, or ask your physicist, are there DVH resolution settings? There, there really don't need to be. There should, 
DVHs should always be high resolution, but again, this was rooted in performance. It used to take a while to calculate DVHs, and now it's an instantaneous calculation. Try to get your bin width, so no matter what your max dose is, you're getting up to 10,000 different bins. That's very high resolution bin width. At least try to get 1,000 bins. I think in one of the planning systems, the default number of bins is 200. Way too low. Then there's also in some systems, so all systems have a bin width. Some systems have grid resolution, which is a, a, a separate sampling grid used only for DVH statistics. If you do have a grid, a DVH sampling resolution, just set it as small as possible so that you reduce the chance of missing the peaks and valleys. Once you determine accurate settings, just be consistent. So find out what's accurate and then use it on every plan. Set up a template, change your defaults, do whatever it takes to that always you know you're using something you can trust. And if you're really feeling your oats today, you can ask your physicist, hey, do you QA your DVH engine, which is prescribed by TG53. So happened, turns out that most sites don't do this or have never done it. Um, it's a good idea to do this. And there are enough independent DVH engines now that you can use them as a sanity check on what you're using in your TPS. Before I end this section, prove it to yourself. Really, this is dose and DVH resolution. If you get a spare hour or two, take a plan you've already done. Calculate it at three different dose grid setting, resolution settings, two, three, and four. And then for each plan, if you have DVH resolution settings, set one high res, maybe 10,000 bins, and then set one low. 200, 500 bins, something like that. Then go in and sample, look, take a look at the DVHs, compare them directly to each other. Do the DVH statistics, are they different? They will be different, in some cases very different. For the exact same plan, just calculated here for three different dose grid resolutions and different DVH settings. Once you see those differences happening, you'll realize resolution matters. The higher resolution, the better. One question we may ask then is whose jurisdiction are these settings? Are they the physicist's responsibility? Or are they the dosimetrist's responsibility? Rephrased, who has the right to change these TPS settings? My answer is who cares? Just do it. Accuracy is everybody's jurisdiction, and accuracy trumps ego. For example, in a best case scenario, you could sit with your physicist and you could say, yeah, we really need to optimize these resolutions and use them for every plan. You, you work together, you figure out settings that, that are adequate and accurate, and you decide to use those from then on. That's the best case scenario. Worst case scenario is the physicist says, don't you dare touch any of those numbers. Just do the treatment plans. That would be a fiefdom. That would be an ego getting in the way of accuracy. Hopefully that doesn't happen. But just realize that accuracy, uh, you know, compromises in resolution and accuracy make your job harder, but Moreover, they make that patient dose plan less accurate, less effective. This is lower quality, and it does impact the treatment of the patient. And again, I'll reiterate to vendors, either take out these options and make it automatically be high resolution, or at least change your defaults to make it adequate. In fact, to be a little cheeky, let's make a deal. For every system that ships with suboptimal default settings, either in dose grid or DVH grid, that TPS vendor has to buy the dosimetry staff lunch. That would be a good deal. And if that were the deal, I think we'd see this problem go away a lot faster. I want to introduce a topic called plan complexity. And complexity can mean a lot of things. I want to simplify it and break a few things down. In other words, I want to make complexity simple. Let me ask you a question. Do you think complexity is defined by the ability to calculate a plan accurately or the ability to deliver a plan accurately? Or does it mean the de ability to deliver a plan efficiently, meaning in a controllable and adequate time frame? Or does it mean the ability to deliver a plan consistently, meaning if you deliver fraction one, two, three, and four, that they'll all be almost identical? That's what I would call robustness. So 
Does it mean calculability, deliverability, efficiency, or robustness? Really, it means all of these things. Let's do a crash course. Uh, when, when we're talking about complexities, it's really introduced by IMRT and BMAT. Um, let's, the, the root of these are wh what I can control, a control point. This is an object inside a DICOM RT plan. It defines any changes that happen in the dynamic nature of delivery. Those are defined by a set of control points. So all modern treatment plans are transferred via DICOM RT plan. A DICOM RT plan has many objects, including a beam object. And beam objects are made up of a sequence of things called control points. Control points capture the specifics and dynamics of delivery, such as the progression of monitor units, the motion of the MLC leaves, collimator job position, the presence of modifiers like wedges, compensators, the isocenter position, the beam geometry, the in other words, gantry couch, collimator angles, all those are defined in these control points. So continuing on, even a simple open field contains at least two control points. Why? Because the first control point will set up the geometric things. Here's the beam, uh, here's the energy, here's the LINAC, that type of thing. But then you need another control point that says, here's the finish of the monitor unit. So your first control point, which is index zero, will have what's called a meter set of zero. And then the next control point would be index one. Nothing will have changed if it's a static beam except the meter set it will now be 1.000, meaning all of the monitor units prescribed for that beam are finished. So at least two control points because you have to deliver monitor units. If we talk about step and shoot IMRT, we, we can break down the step and the shoot. The step is when the beams or the monitor unit is turned off, but the leaves move to the next position or the next segment. The shoot would be when the monitor units are on, the MLC leaves are static in that portion and the monitor units are delivered. Then the beam is turned off and we get to the next step portion. For a step and shoot IMRT beam, the number of segments or the number of different apertures that you're adding up is equal to half the number of control points because half of them are steps and half of them are shots. Dynamic is different. You think this is sliding window which inherently is VMAT. VMAT is like sliding window but now we're rotating the gantry in addition to smoothly sliding the MLC leaves. Here the beam is more or less on the whole time. You can turn the dose rate or the monitor units to zero during portions of it, but here you're not stepping and shooting, you're just, the beam is on and you're sweeping MLC leaves and gantries. Here the number of control points is much higher because we are sweeping across and the MLC subbeam shapes are generally much more complex. Let me show you a movie here. I have a movie of a step and shoot. Let me play the movie. And down at the bottom you'll see the prog progression of control points and you see as that thing moves along every other control point you see the m leaves move and then the alternate control points are when the monitor units are delivered. So here is a case where there were um, a total of 18 control points and there were nine segments. A total of 72 monitor units were delivered during the nine shoot portions and then the MLC leaves were moved during the other uh, uh, nine step. Here's a sliding window movie. And you're going to see this look a little different. First of all, the number of control points is not 18 anymore. It's 229. And you'll see a constant motion of these very complex shapes. Now notice here, look how skinny and tiny these individual segments are that are part of this sweeping beam. That doesn't mean it's undeliverable. That doesn't mean it's inaccurate. It means it's dynamic. We're really painting a dose across. You're throwing more monitor units in there, um, but you're, get, you're getting a smoother dose distribution. So this would have been an IMRT um, sliding window or dynamic. Let's look at a VMAT plan. If you look in the upper left, you'll see the gantry as it moves. And I'm gonna, let me start the control points. Not only are the now the MLC leaves moving, but the gantry is moving as well. All of the information on how this happened are captured in these control points. So think of a VMAT as a sliding window with the gantry moving. And of course, all the different shapes and the monitor units and the dose rate were optimized by the inverse planning engine. When you do sliding window in VMAT, 
by the very nature, all the MLC shapes become much more complex than if you do a simple step and shoot. That's just the natural progression of of uh, of how to get the uh, high conformality, but it doesn't necessarily make it more complex. Are large numbers of control points automatically a bad thing? Some people think so, but no, they're not. The number of control points does not add to the complexity, it, you know, at the root. So not necessarily. I think a lot of people think the more control points, the more complex, the less accurate, don't do it. That's a very much an old school step and shoot mentality. Are small segments within a series of control points necessarily a bad thing? No, not necessarily. Back in the old days, we physicists wanted to avoid very small segments for two reasons. One, we may not have trusted our algorithm there, or we may not have done the small field uh, calibrations. Or maybe it's just because adding in all those small segments added to the treatment time. But that's, not, that's only true for old school step and shoot mode. When you're doing dynamic, as we saw, we have so many small segments that we have to be able to model these, a model these accurately. And they can be delivered very quick in dynamic mode. Are small monitor units per segment necessarily a bad thing? No, it if for step and shoot they probably are because you're, you're taking the trouble to move the MLC leaves an irradiated segment with very small monitor units. It may be a waste, but in dynamic delivery, this is a very natural thing. So for people doing sliding window or arc therapy, which is VMAT, all beams have a lot of control points, have a lot of small segments, and have a lot of segments with small monitor units, that doesn't mean they're more complex. So any view where you think complexity means it's the number of control points or the size of the segments, that's a simplistic view, a little bit myopic. It's rooted in a step and shoot mindset. But complexity is a real thing. It just might not be what you think it is. And again, let's attack it with this profound knowledge mindset about complexity. Complexity is anything that might increase the error or uncertainty, anything that might increase the variation from fraction to fraction and thus degrade the quality. That's really what complexity is. That's a very general definition. What is complex for system A may not be complex for system B. For an example, uh, let uh, some of you may use a Siemens Linac. They're notoriously slow in delivering IMRT because a lot of pauses that happen during step and shoot. So if you have a 20 or 30 segment IMRT beam on a Siemens Linac, it may be way too complex because it takes forever to deliver that thing. But if you do that on a variant machine, bam, 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 it's done that quickly. So what's complex for system A may not be complex for system B. If you're using Pinnacle DMPO and your physicist is telling you to throw out small segments, if they're telling you that's because uh, it makes it less accurate, that's not true at all. We know we can calculate small segments pretty accurately. It may be because it just makes the delivery faster. Complexly related problems that are hard to change include limits of the TPS dose algorithm. That's a systematic problem. Or a limit of a LINAC delivery. That would be like the Siemens example where the MLC motion is typically very slow. Complexity related problems that are under your control if you're a physicist would be the beam model quality. If you are avoiding small segments because your beam model stinks, then if you make your beam model mo uh, uh, better, you can throw out these restrictions on small segments. Um, if the calibration of your MLC leaves or in some instances your collimator is poor, you may want to try to reduce all the different uh, you know, edges you're seeing on the MLC, that would, again, mean fewer segments. But that's something you can control. You can calibrate and do your MLC QA and your LINAC QA as are, as are prescribed. Complexity-related problems that are under your control if you're a treatment planning, well, if you do have problems you need to avoid, you can set planning rules to avoid the limits of the algorithm, to avoid the beam model weaknesses, or to avoid the delivery weaknesses. That's to a certain extent under your control. The problem is here, whenever you have different planning rules, so for, for example, someone says never have a segment size smaller than X, or never have a monitor unit per segment smaller than Y. Those are planning rules that you have to abide by. They really make your job harder. 
They limit your freedom in planning. Is that a good thing? I would say if the rule is made to avoid an otherwise unavoidable systematic error, then yeah, y you probably need to abide that rule. But if the rule is made to avoid an unavoidable random error, oh, no, I'm sorry, if the rule is made to avoid an, an unavoidable random error, then again, it's a rule because you can't get around it. So you're trying to mitigate that risk. However, that's all risk mitigation. That's basically saying we know there are problems in these situations, so avoid those situations. But if the rule is made to avoid an avoidable systematic error, then the rule is bad. It's going against dimming quality philosophy, which means root out the systematic errors so that you don't have these restrictions anymore. If it's an avoidable error, the best option is always to remove the source of the error. Let's use a simple analogy. Let's say you have a rule for yourself and you say you live in a, a cold climate and you have a self-imposed rule to avoid driving the steep hill when there's snow. If this rule is because you have a rear-wheel drive sports car, it's probably a good rule because you might get stuck. A pertinent aside might be maybe you need a four-wheel drive in that climate, but if you have a, a rear-wheel drive and that's the only car you have, avoiding that hill is probably smart. But let's say you did have a four-wheel drive and you still avoided the hill, but you avoided it because your four-wheel drive needed repair, this would be an unwise rule because you're letting that systematic error, the broken four-wheel drive, you're letting that persist in the system. That causes indirect costs. In this analogy, it would be you have to take a longer route. It may take you longer, cost more gas, cost more time. This is something you can remove by just fixing your four-wheel drive so you can get up that hill. Same goes with the planning system. An example of one avoidable problem might be if you are told to minimum to uh, abide by a minimum segment size and you're doing this to avoid segments that your physicist don't, doesn't think can be calculated accurately or similarly if you're asked to set a max on the number of control points for the same reason. If calculability is given as the reason then I object to this because as you saw earlier many systems are capable of calculating these dynamic be it DMLC or VMAT accurately we saw how many complex segments that would never pass these minimum segment size or minimum monitor unit rules. They are easily calculated with high accuracy with a good B model. So that is a bad reason. Um, these modern TPS can be made accurate with a good B model. Remove the source of the error by improving the B model. Now let me qualify the objection. If the TPS dose algorithm or the physics beam model really is bad, then while as long as it's bad, you have to follow the rule, but if possible, fix the problem. If it turns out calculability is not the real reason, and really it was the deliverability or the efficiency, that's a different story. We can't have patients lying on the table for 30 minutes for a fraction. It gets to be very uncomfortable. So here I want to reiterate that what's complex for system A may be easy for system B. My point here is that I don't want you to think complexity is related strictly to the number of control points or the, the, the shape or complexity of the segments. The number of control points can be very high and a plan can be delivered with great accuracy. The, the segments can be very strange and unwieldy and they can still be calculated and delivered with great accuracy. That is not the reason. The reason is usually something else. And the something else, if it's something you can get rid of, by all means get rid of it. One more comment on calculability. Again, just going back in history, I hear a lot of people really think the control points drives the complexity. And, the, and, and there's this whole minimum segment size mentality. I find this mostly in the Pinnacle user base. You don't find this in the Eclipse user base, for example, where they're used to dynamic treatments by, by default. But DMPO, which is a very smart algorithm, its whole purpose for being is to minimize the number of segments, to make the delivery more efficient for step and shoot only. So DMPO, you're trying to drive down the number of segments. We know the number of segments is half the number of control points. By the way, one of the planning systems calls these wrong. They think a segment is a control point. It's not. Segments are half the number of control points for step and shoot at least. 
Um, so DMPO, people think, the a lot of people think more co no more control points, the worse it is because the more segments it is. But that's really the wrong thinking. It may be true for step and shoot, but it's certainly not true in general. Um, Siemens Linux, there's a history here where people needed to minimize the number of segments because otherwise the, the uh, deliveries got really long. So this was an efficiency issue. And then the history of IMRT, believe it or not, the dose calculations used to be very hard to get correct for, for complex segments. Not so much anymore. Improvements have been made. But there's a lot of history here where physicists would try to avoid really small segments because they didn't think it could be modeled accurately. And there may be some systems where the beam model is so bad that it doesn't do it accurately. But, th but on all the modern planning systems that I've dealt with, Pinnacle, Eclipse, XEO, these types of things, you can create it so that the uh, monitoring accuracy is, is, is good even for IMRT or VMAT beams that have complex segments. In an ideal world of very accurate TPS algorithms, in optimized TPS beam models and in well calibrated delivery systems, plan complexity would reduce to one thing and one thing only and it would be delivery efficiency how fast can this be delivered and more complex would just mean it takes longer so as an aside there's really a growing need to accurately quantify the delivery efficiency during the treatment planning process the planning systems won't tell you except for maybe tomotherapy which is inherently time based your planning system doesn't tell you here's what the fraction delivery time will be it would be nice if it did because then that could be another critical metric to consider for plan acceptance this is empowering to the treatment planner rather than being constraining because you could say basically here's your per fraction budget in time spend it wisely so you wouldn't discover at the last second oh my gosh this fraction took 10 minutes just in beam on time that's too long you would know that in the planning process you would be able to have quantify that complexity or that efficiency up front and then you could maybe lose some of your rules that you've been abiding thinking you're avoiding long treatment times and maybe they wouldn't have been long at all. But again, I think this would be a nice tool for the treatment planner to have. It'd be a new challenge or a goal for each treatment plan. Instead of basically imposing planning rules that may be uh, potentially unjustified in a modern planning system. I think the plan checklist for the future is going to be, are you meeting your target coverage? Are you meeting your organ at risk dose volume goals? And then finally, are you meeting the fractional efficiency requirement? We're not there yet, but it would be a nice thing to have. And the fractional efficiency would be basically, what's the time slot you have to work in? Let's call it 15 minutes. What's the approximate or average setup time for a patient? And that may depend on the different immobilization devices. Minus the IGRT time, and then of course then the patient exit time. If you take all those things out, that becomes your time budget. And you could uh, use that as a treatment plan requirement. So what now? I just want you to understand complexity. It's not necessarily the number of control points. It's not necessarily the size of the segments. Understand if you do have treatment planning rules imposed on you, you should ask why and if that why is valid or not. You should consider delivery efficiency during treatment planning. Don't create a treatment plan that's going to take too long to deliver. And ask your physicist if they have applied stringent dose QA analyses to fine-tune their beam model to root out lingering systematic errors because if they do this then the number of constraints you'll have in avoiding certain segments etc those constraints will be removed and you may have more freedoms as a treatment planner which would make your life easier finally let's do a quick review of margins which you're all pros on but just to reiterate that in order to generate a robust treatment plan we need to anticipate errors, errors that can happen in real life, such as in the setup of a patient or in the motion of targets during a fraction. GTV, as we know, is the palpable or what I might call the demonstrable uh, target. The CTV would be the GTV plus where microscopic disease, maybe that can't be imaged um, very easily, maybe that's where that is, so we, we want to make sure to irradiate that region. Internal target volume, or the ITV, is if there is intrafractional motion, such as that caused by breathing or 
the potential intrafractional motion. You need to in encapsulate that so that if this really does make the target volume bigger. And then, of course, the PTV adds to all of that a geometric variation that corresponds to uh, not only an internal error, but then the setup margin or setup error. One thing we have to realize is we usually think of, think of margins in terms of the targets. But whenever you have, for example, a setup error, you're not just affecting where the target is, you're affecting where the critical organs are. And oftentimes they can be moved into harm's way. And that's why you see uh, margins more and more added to critical organs such as the spinal cord where RTOG protocols may ask you to uh, have dose constraints on the cord plus five millimeters, for example. That's all related to the fact that when we set up a patient, we're, we're not able to duplicate that virtual patient identically. Highly conformal plans sculpt dose to match the target volumes, and the, more con the conventional wisdom is that the more conformal a plan is, the better it is. But of course, a small reality check here could be we're conforming it to the, uh, to the m targets that are based on contours, and are the contours accurate? At the root of it all, the contours have to be accurate or else we're shaping the dose to the wrong thing. But I digress. Um, now what IGRT adds is the presumption of higher setup accuracy. If, if you take a picture, volumetric picture of the target or the patient right before you treat, you can optimize the position of the target to be where it should be. The uh, assumption here is that you can perhaps justify smaller m setup margins, smaller margins to create the PTV. Reality check here is um, sometimes pictures lie and stuff also moves. You may perfectly align, for example, the prostate prior to the first beam being delivered, but maybe by the time the therapist is out of the room and the first beam is being delivered, gas might have moved through the bowel and the prostate may be a centimeter away where it was. So you got to realize reality happens more conformal and smaller margins really sounds great, and it makes beautiful conformal pictures, but it also creates a bigger risk, intolerant reality. If there's a small miss and you have high gradients and small margins, you just created a worse situation rather than a better situation. I thought I'd show uh, margins with simulation by showing how DVH has changed due to setup errors, both random and systematic. Here I'm only going to look at random errors. Let's take a look. This is a prostate plan. This was from the plan challenge from 2011. Really conformal, one of the higher scoring plans with a PQM score of 135, and I think the high was about 140 or something. So this is really a nice conformal plan. So I thought it would be a good example. Really nice margins were added to the PTV here, 10 millimeter margin, which is which is a nice realistic margin. Uh, everyone was provided these contours to optimize on. When I go to the PTV68 and run the simulations, we see a degradation in dose because the PTV, no matter which direction it goes, it's being pushed into a smaller dose region. So the PTV DVH will degrade massively with setup errors. But look what happens when I model the GTV, in this case was the prostate bed. For those same random errors, Look how nice and tight the, the white lines here match the red line of the planned do DVH really well because no matter what their random error is, it's still inside that margin. It's exactly just a good demonstration. Now, if we were able to reduce the ac or if we were able to improve the accuracy to always be within five millimeters, then our PTV becomes degradation becomes much less. And we can see now when we deliver that. Uh, we get almost exactly the DVH. So the point here is that we are trying to protect or preserve the CTV or the GTV uh, DVH and trying to minimize its degradation. Now I'm running simulations on the rectum. So random errors, can, they can be nothing. They can be up to 10 mil or 5 millimeters in this case. You see the rectum DVH, of course, changes. And uh, we don't have a margin on the rectum. So if we have errors up to 10 millimeters on the rectum, you see things are always getting worse. It's always moving into higher dose regions and our DVH gets worse. Now that's one thing we don't consider. We don't have margins uh, for the rectum. 
So the take-home message here is that when we have adequate margins, we can have errors in setup, and our coverage on the GTV and the CTV is, is robust. The PTV coverage blows up, but that's exactly why the PTV was there in the first place. It was a planning target volume that was allowing for certain errors in setup. Here's a head neck plan where we can have tighter margins on the target. This was also uh, in the plan challenge, in a, in a different plan challenge. I think it's from the year before, 2010. So again, let's look at the PTV and let's model uh, different types of setup errors. And again, they're all random and they're different every fraction. And I'm going to model seven different full courses of treatment. And look at the PTV. Of course, it's going to degrade. Here the simulations take a little longer because the volume is much bigger. But the white lines, we'll see them uh, refresh in a moment. I apologize. You see here are all the different possibilities of what we saw if we simulated a full course seven times. We'll kind of watch it again, watch the white lines. So you can see the PTV coverage blows up. But that's okay because the PTV was only there for the purpose of protecting the CTV, making it robust with respect to setup errors. So now what I'll do is I'll model the CTV with the same errors. Oh, actually the GTV, so that's inside. Now you see um, you still see degradation. Okay, this is because this is the uh, high target inside of a bigger target. The margin wasn't adequate in this case. The margin was 5 millimeters and the setup error emulated was 10 millimeters. So we saw the GTV coverage was terrible. Now when we use a 5 millimeter margin but only al allow errors up to 5 millimeters, you see the GTV is perfectly covered on every simulation. So the point here was that that margin has to be greater than or equal to any anticipated setup error. And if so, then you preserve the, uh, 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 the coverage very well. So that's the point. The margin must be adequate, which we all know. So margins are very important. They are basically respecting reality. Margins make a plan robust with, or what I like to do is they save your you know what. What does this mean to you is that you can know their purposes and know how and why they are set the way they are. If there's no rhyme or reason to how you're setting margins, for example, if you're reducing margins, but it's not justified and quantified by, say, improvements in immobilization and image guidance, then reducing those margins is just making your plan less robust. Take the previous example where we saw the head neck, with which had margins of 5 millimeters, when we simulated errors up to 10 millimeters, the GTV coverage was terrible in every, in every course. So do a sanity check. Do the setup margins reflect the real, the real system performance? And the system here is your therapist setting the patient up. And if you have IGRT, it's the IGRT system. But also, do they uh, uh, account for potential intrafractional motion? If you're setting margins uh, near the rectal wall of 3 or 4 or 5 millimeters, you've got to ask yourself, is that really realistic? A lot of people think it is because it looks good on the screen. I'm a little skeptical, but realize that the margins, the, sh the smaller they are, the higher the risk of missing the target and of irradiating the critical organs. So don't forget that setup errors affect organs at risk, too. Um, just because we put margins on the target, that protects the coverage. But it also, if, we're, if we have a cord where we're pushing the tolerance on the max dose, realize if we set it up and we move the cord into harm's way, we are now exceeding tolerance. So the setup error doesn't just affect the, uh, the accuracy of locating the target. It moves the other stuff around as well. So you all knew about margins, but I thought running some simulations to exemplify how uh, uh, margins actually keep, a, keep CTV and GTV coverage safe as long as the margins are big enough to incorporate the errors. That was the point. Now in conclusion here, we've talked about five things it's good for a treatment planner to know about physics. There are of course in turn things that a physicist should know about treatment planning. 
There's a lot of them, but I'll just go five here that kind of make sense now. A poor beam model hinders the treatment planner. You don't have as uh, as as you don't have the sight on your gun. You're not going to shoot straight. So physicists should always optimize the beam model because it's going to make treatment planning more robust and more accurate. Second, the QA calc grid resolution should always be set to be equal to the patient calc grid resolution, and both of them should be high resolution. If you can, if you can afford it in time, set it to be two millimeters. If you're at four, it's just too much. Four millimeters is just too much. You need to stop doing that. Whether you know it or not, DVH settings affect uh, your treatment planning. So as a physicist, if you know of DVH settings, you should optimize and automate the best DVH settings. Optim uh, set them up so that they're defaults, templates, scripts, whatever it takes to ensure that they are used for every treatment plan. I think as a physicist, you need to quantify and moderate true complexity. It is a real thing. Um, if there are unavoidable errors, you need to create planning rules. But don't use this as a crutch for poor beam modeling or lack of system commissioning. Finally, maybe the physicist's job to actually do the QA of the IGRT system so that you can really quantify the limits of setup and IGRT accuracy. You may not be able to locate those targets as accurate as you think you are. And shrinking of margins may be the wrong thing to do. You need to quantify it. You need to know your performance of your IGRT system and your therapist is part of that. Once you know the limits, you train and educate the doctor and clearly define what margins to use for which patients so that you know your margins are protecting you from what you know is going to happen, which are random errors in setup and random intrafractional motion. So that's in conclusion. Thanks for your time and interest. And again, I'd like to close by saying hopefully there are a lot of topics that you'd like to know more about that are traditionally considered physics topics, but they're important to you as a treatment planner. You want to understand things, especially with a lot of hypofractionation and a lot of SBRT, higher dose per fraction, and a lot more topics to talk about. Please submit your requests for such topics to your leadership at AAMD. And what I think they'll do is they will say, hey, we have a lot of people who are interested in topic A and B and C. And they may be able to uh, recruit somebody to create some training on that and make it available to you via the AAMD website. I think they provide a lot of value in the meetings and, and continuing education on the website. So if you have things you want to know, I know your AAMD leadership. They're great. They really uh, are thinking about you guys all the time. And I think they would accommodate your wishes here. All right. Have a great day.